You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. The Teaching of the Master by Brother L.G. Sargent Section 5 Living in God Chapter 1 The Magnet of the Heart Matthew 6 verse 19 to 23 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves dig through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not dig through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. The lamp of the body is the eye, If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body will be dark. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, the darkness, how great it is! The underlying theme of Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 18 has been that the true and eternal reward can only come as the result of a life of communion with God. And this leads on to a new section in which the reward is contemplated as the true treasure of life. The two sections are joined in thought by several interwoven strands. In contrast with the true worship is hypocrisy and in contrast with the true treasure, is avarice. The two are so often found together that they may be reckoned as the twin spiritual perils of the pursuit of righteousness. And if the righteousness which many of the Pharisees showed was hollow, so were the riches in which they trusted. With a force which tends to be weakened in translation, Jesus says, Treasure not up for yourselves, treasure upon earth. Men think they make lasting provision when they lay by a store of valuable clothes, supplies of corn, or a hoard of money. But moth may destroy the fabrics, insects and rodents corrupt the grain and render it worthless, and thieves may burrow through the mud walls of the houses, dig through, the revised version margin has it, and steal the gold, perhaps killing the owner to escape detection. The saying covers all the forms in which wealth was customarily hoarded. Rust is literally eating, and more probably refers to devouring by vermin than to chemical changes in metal. James, however, in a passage obviously based on the Lord's saying, uses a word which specifically means metallic corrosion. This is James chapter 5, verse 2 to 3. Buried in the Lord's words is a double allusion to Isaiah, which calls for a further examination of some passages referred to in an earlier chapter. In a prophecy of the suffering servant, in Isaiah 50, verse 9, it is said, Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment, the moth shall eat them up. In the following chapter, the faith of the servant is made a pattern for the people of God for whom he suffers, and his words are repeated in calling on them to look at the eternal realities in contrast to the heavens and the earth of a passing world order. And so the people in whose heart is God's law are adjured not to fear the reproach of men. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be for ever, and my salvation unto all generations. 
When the allusion to those passages is recognized, the Lord's reference to everyday facts of decay and loss carries an overtone of meaning. The saying still declares plainly enough that earthly riches may perish, and only the treasures of the Spirit are unfading. But the spoiled grain and the moth-eating cloak are also pictorial emblems for something more. They are the symbols of a world in which men set their hearts, and those whose hearts are in the world are as doomed to perish as the world order to which they belong. They, like it, shall vanish like smoke. Behind the Lord's words is the same profound belief as in the prophet that enduring life can only be found in the eternal and victorious righteousness of God. Therefore, says Jesus, treasure up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Earth and heaven, as simple terms for place, give the saying poetic antithesis. But in Jewish usage, heaven is a reverential synonym for God, and in heaven is equivalent to with God. The Old Testament speaks of God as laying up a store for the righteous. If their desire is set on this divine treasure, then they indeed have treasure with God. But God may store judgment for the future as well as goodness, and a man's own life determines of which kind the store shall be. So men may be said to lay it up by their own action. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. For this reason James, in the passage quoted above, tells the godless rich, Ye have laid up your treasure in the last days. James 5 verse 3, the vice versa. In heaping up earthly treasures by extortion and oppression, they have accumulated another store the wrath that is reserved for them in the day of judgment. And James, with the proverb about the day of wrath in mind, is giving a pungent turn to the figures used by Jesus. It is another example of the rich elusiveness of Scripture, in which streams from two sources can merge in a single phrase. Paul also has his allusion to the Lord's words when he exhorts Timothy to charge them that are rich in this world not to have their hope set on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, and that they be rich in good works, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on the life which is life indeed. Not only does God lay up treasure for those who are God-fearing, but they are a treasure to Him. They shall be mine, He says, in the day that I do make, even a peculiar treasure. This is the kernel of Malachi's message, that the true Israel are they that fear the Lord, and who alone are written in His book of remembrance and it deliberately recalls the use of the same expression at the beginning of Israel's national history. They are chosen as God's prized possession. But it is Abraham's seed of faith who are truly God's treasure. And so Peter writes to those sojourners of the dispersion who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And in the language of the Lord, and in the spirit of the prophet, he says, But ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that ye should show forth the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. These are the Lord's inheritance, a term which is used of Israel of old, 
and Paul, applying the Old Testament language to the spiritual Israel, can write to the Ephesians of the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. But if they are the Lord's inheritance, he also is theirs. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Psalm 16, verses 5 to 6. The words are those of the Spirit of Christ in the Psalms. For what of true is him is also true of those who are in him. If they are the Lord's treasure, so he is theirs. And they can cry with Asaph, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the rock of my heart and my portion for ever. In the light of these sayings of the psalmist, we can feel the force of the Lord's words. For where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. The heart will turn as surely as the needle of the compass towards what we really value. No amount of outward religious performance will change its direction for long if the world provides its pole. But if God is our prized possession, then to him our hearts will be drawn, and he is the only possession which can never perish, and can ensure that the possessors will never perish either. We cannot pretend that delight and a sense of wealth in God come easily to human nature. Only a long and constant direction of the mind can bring the consciousness of that precious treasure. Set your mind, says Paul, set it like a ship on a course, on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Life is our treasure and our treasure, like our citizenship, is in heaven. Christ, too, had his treasure, which God had laid up for him from the beginning of the ages, for he could pray to the Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. A share in his glory will be the lot of those who are meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, for whom the hope is laid up in the heavens, for Christ in them is the hope of glory. The eye is the light-giver of the body. Unless light can penetrate it, all is dark within, however bright the sunlight around. And so, by a kind of metonymy, Jesus calls it the lamp. The world is light for a man with a clear eye, and he himself is, as it were, filled with light. So it is in the things of the Spirit. The sunlight of God's truth shines around, but can it enter the man? If it cannot, nothing irradiates the darkness of his own nature, and if that which ought to convey light is darkened, that which is by nature dark must be dark indeed. What can darken the eye so that it fails of its function? The clue is in the context. Jesus has been talking of the treasure on which men's heart is set, and in Jewish usage the single and evil eye have particular meanings which go back to the Old Testament. When a poor Israelite wanted to borrow, Beware, says Moses to the potential lender, lest there be a base thought in thine heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil toward thy brother, and thou give him naught. The evil eye was blind to the other's need, and saw only the chances of gain or loss. 
But when famine came in the siege as one of the punishments on disobedient Israel, a man might look on his closest kin with an eye even more perverted. He might be driven to a dreadful greed. His eyes shall be evil towards his brother, so that he shall not give any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat. Desire for possession is the motive which corrupts the eye. He that hath an evil eye hasteth after riches. Greed leads to envy, and envy to treachery. Eat not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, for as he reckoneth within himself, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. On the other hand, he that hath a bountiful margin good eye, shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. In the New Testament, an evil eye is one of the defilements coming from within, out of the heart of man. And when the householder in the parable rebukes the labourers who grudge the late comers equal pay, he says, Is thine eye evil, because I am good? Are they greedy and envious because he is generous? The evil eye results from an attachment to earthly treasure, which corrupts the spirit and blinds the heart. The good or single eye, on the other hand, is that of the liberal man, whose vision is unclouded by greed, and his mind not divided by envy. And so singleness becomes a New Testament term, and especially a Pauline term for liberality. In Luke 11, verses 33 to 36, a familiar saying is found in the discourse which follows the Lord's refusal to give a sign other than the sign of the prophet Jonah. The generation who sought a sign when they had him in their midst were condemned by the example of the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba. If they had not been blind, they would have no need to make the request. If they could not see the living sign, it was because they themselves were full of darkness, and the organ which should let light into them was diseased. In this context, single and evil must have a wider meaning. They were blinded by jealousy rather than by a niggardly spirit. But in Matthew the words form a bridge between the saying about treasure and the warning against mammon. The Teaching of the Master by Brother L. G. Sargent Part 5 Chapter 2 The Lord of the Heart Matthew 6, verse 24 and 25 No man can serve two masters, but either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than the food, and the body than the raiment? In the first three Gospels, the verb to serve is applied to the relation between men and God only here 
and in Luke 16, verse 13, and in the latter, where a similar saying follows the parable of the unrighteous steward, it takes the form, No servant, household servant or steward, can serve two masters. The verb arises naturally from the parabolic figure of two masters, but as applied to the followers of God, it has a special fitness, for in Oriental life, sonship implied service, as in the parable of the two sons in Matthew 21, verse 28 to 30. Where life was mainly agricultural, it was natural for the sons to work under the father on the family farm. The more well-to-do, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, would have three forms of service, that of their sons, the hired servants, and bondmen. So the elder son complains, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And part of the sin of the prodigal was that by his departure he had deprived his father of his services. Strictly, however, the verb means to be a slave, to serve as a bondman. And the stricter meaning has its place in the saying in Matthew. A man might be employed as a hired servant by two masters, but he can be a bond slave only to one, for only one at a time can own him. What then is a man who treasures up earthly wealth? Is he not the master of his own resources to do as he will with them? Does he not control the power which they bring? No, says Jesus. It is the riches who are the master, and he is the slave. He does not own them so much as they own him, because they have his heart. They have him altogether. By dominating his desires, they corrupt his spiritual vision, and as a blind man, he is at their mercy. And so, as a climax to the steps in thought in the preceding verses, Jesus now personifies riches as Mammon, the master. The term is well known in the Talmud and Targums, and usually occurs with some qualifying expression. The Mammon of wickedness, the Mammon of falsehood, and so on. In the same way, Jesus speaks of the Mammon of unrighteousness. Nowhere in Jewish literature, it seems, is Mammon anything more than a personification, and nowhere is the personification so vivid as in the words of Jesus. In Matthew 6, verse 24, Mammon stands unmasked as a false god, for it is a psychological truth that covetousness is idolatry. It sets up an idol in the heart, and though, like Molech of old, the idol may be nothing in the world, Yet, like Molech, through its power over the imagination, it claims its human sacrifices. In stark opposition, therefore, are God and Mammon, and like the Israelites on Mount Carmel, men must choose whom they will serve. They cannot really halt between two opinions. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves bond-slaves to obey? His bond-slaves ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Jesus' teaching is uncompromising. There is no service of God but whole-hearted service. And the man who thinks he can serve both God and the world a little deceives himself. Love and hate may not have here the emotional force which we commonly attach to them. Even in Deuteronomy 22, verses 15 to 17, they mean to prefer and to slight, or be indifferent to. Strong preferences described by Hebrew idiom in these sharply antithetic terms. But however we understand them, we must not weaken the antithesis. A man is confronted by a moral choice. 
He must choose by an act of will, and as he chooses, so he must live. If he does not choose God, he has, by that fact, entered the service of God's enemy. It is one of the remarkable facts about Jesus that he himself demands no lesser loyalty from those who would follow him. To the man who wanted to defer a response indefinitely by pleading home ties, he says, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their dead. Warning the disciples of the family divisions his message would cause, and of the conflict of loyalties which would result, he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that doth not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He makes on men the same decisive demands as God, and the apostles, his brothers James and Jude included, can fittingly call themselves bond slaves of Christ, for he too is the master. It is as the bond slave of Christ, his vision sharpened by service, that James reflects this irreconcilable antagonism between God and mammon when he says the friendship of the world is enmity with God and draws the conclusion from it in concrete terms. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The connection is closer than appears in brief quotation. James has been contrasting envying and strife with the wisdom which is from above, and traces the source of envy to a desire for possession. The motive of that desire is that men may consume the, the possession upon their pleasures. The context shows that by pleasures James does not mean only social pleasure or entertainment, though these are not excluded. His thought includes all the gratification of human passions, which wealth gives the power to indulge. And they may be none the less pleasures, even if many of them are, like envy, very near to pain. The world which the men whom he describes are allied is the sphere of the passions of men, whose minds dwell solely in the material and visible order. And the prince of that world is Mammon. Mammon does not stand only for hoarded wealth. His service includes all anxious striving for material things, and the poor whose minds are consumed with their poverty may be as much his slaves as the rich who scheme to be richer. Neither can have their hearts in earth and heaven at the same time. In nothing is human nature more prone to lose the end in the means than in the preoccupation with bodily needs. How many people kill themselves with worrying whether they will have enough to live on? How many more make life a burden for the same cause, and so deprive it of any value? In moments of detachment we can see this strange self-stultification by which men destroy a thing in the very act of agonizing to preserve it. And we recognize it as the most poignant example of that emptiness and striving after wind, which the preacher found to be characteristic of human life. Yet at the same time, and in some measure, we all fall into the fallacy. This much is discernible to reasoning which does not rise above the level of the earth. But when Jesus says the life is more than the food which sustains it, he carries us to an altogether higher realm. He has implicitly brought God into the comparison. Who gave the life? Who formed the body? If we could not produce these for ourselves, why should we think it depends solely on us to provide the food and clothing which they need? If God has given the greater gift, will he not give the lesser? Take no thought, says the authorised version, in the language of the 17th century, in which Francis Bacon could say that a man 
died with thought and anguish. The sense of anxiety and often of despondency is prominent in the usage of the time and was doubtless present to the mind of the translators. Is this the meaning of the original? Nearly all modern versions give anxious care or some equivalent, not because the word used necessarily has this meaning, but because it is the meaning which is deemed to fit the context and to be justified by general biblical usage. While this removes a possible misunderstanding, we must beware of limiting the idea unduly to mere fret. While the Lord does not forbid honest provision, he certainly forbids all preoccupation with bodily needs, whether the mood be anxious or assertive. As to biblical usage, whatever the classical force of the term, both its noun and verb are found in the Septuagint in contexts which indicate care, anxiety, distress, as the prevailing, though not the exclusive, sense. So too in the New Testament. Though the sense of a godly care for one another's welfare is sometimes found. In the Lord's exposition of the parable of the sower, where he speaks of the cares of this world and riches and desires, he is thinking of the consuming concern which chokes the germinating word of the gospel. Particularly interesting is Peter's casting all your care upon him, because he is quoting the Septuagint of Psalm 55, verse 22, Cast thy burden on the Lord. This act of confident trust is in Peter's mind the sequel to humbling yourselves under the mighty hand of God. It is the product of a childlike humility, whereas the effort to carry the burden ourselves is the expression of human pride. In such association of ideas, do we not catch an unmistakable echo of the chief shepherd of whom Peter has been writing? And are we not justified in taking this as a guide to the meaning of the word in the Lord's use? Take no thought may then be understood as do not burden yourself with care for your life. Do not try to carry the burden that is not yours, but have peace of mind. The thought is common to Jesus and to Peter that those who are the object of God's guarding care have no need to carry a load of anxiety. He careth for you, says Peter, using a different word which means he makes you the object of his interest. And in so saying, he's drawing out in plain prose the thought which is poetically implied in the sermon. While then mere human shrewdness can see the folly of ruining life in the effort to maintain it, Jesus sees men under the shadowing arm of God. He speaks with the sublime assurance of one to whom creation is not a remote theory of man's origin, but an ever-present fact. God created man, and what he created will be the object of his continuing concern. Moreover, the disciples to whom Jesus is speaking are chosen and called for the fuller life of the kingdom of God. They are to be the subjects of a new creation. God, therefore, is not only their source and origin. He surrounds them. He is their constant environment. They are in him. And from this Jesus draws one conclusion, which for him is self-evident. The daily life that is lived in God is not life without labour or without forethought, but it is emphatically life without care.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.